So when we talked about pain signaling, I told you that the, the region of the brain that interprets sensory information is in the postcentral sensory cortex, the postcentral gyrus. And right in front of it, in the frontal lobe, right here, that's the precentral gyrus, and that's where your principal motor areas are. These different regions of the brain, they're called the Brodmann areas. So this is the, the motor area is called Brodmann area number four. And it has a homunculus, just like the sensory area did. And here it is. So this is medial, this is lateral. And you go from your toes most medial to your face, tongue, and swallowing muscles most lateral. And so if you wanted to move your tongue, you'd get an impulse here and you'd send it on down, ultimately down to your spinal cord. And so the motor cortex is arranged where we have voluntary control of movement from our cortex, from the motor area, from Brodmann 4. And we can send impulses right down the cord. And from the cord, it gets picked up in the ventral horn, the information. So the, the, the sensory stuff is in the dorsal horn. The ventral horn is where the motor uh, neurons sit, their cell bodies sit in the ventral horn. And then we send the nerve out to the muscles and make them contract. And there's some stuff in between. Now, the cortex doesn't just so simply, without review, send impulses down to make the muscles move. The cortex is constantly having chatter with the brain stem. And then the brain stem talks to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum talks to the thalamus. And the thalamus is also talking at the same time to the basal ganglia. The areas that we had talked about a little bit earlier that are destroyed with Parkinson's. And the cortex talks to the basal ganglia. So the cortex is talking over here, it's talking directly, but there's all this feedback loop. And then you determine the magnitude of output in neural uh, information to make the muscles contract. So these are descending pathways that ultimately come out of the cortex come out of the brain stem they're sort of checked by the thalamus in the process before they make their way down the cord and activate the motor neuron so this is a cartoon showing you the basal ganglia in close proximity to the thalamus and that crosstalk with the cortex the basal ganglia is helping you regulate the movement and it's showing the cerebellum coming back up in here and, and helping with the decision process. So your initiation of movement, your coordination of movement, all of these activities rely on this feedback scheme. The cerebellum has a couple of areas to it. So if you're looking at the back, it's the dark part, the front of the cerebellum, it's the lighter brown part and has an anterior lobe, a posterior lobe, and a flocconodular lobe. And the cerebellum is this place where it's almost like your learning memory um, uh, of movements. So like when you play the piano, when you first start to play a song, it takes a while to get the coordination, but then that gets stored somewhere so you can just play the song or you hit a tennis ball. At first it's hard, but then it just becomes a natural movement. That natural movement is from circuitry cuts in the cerebellum. So this is your, 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 your movement memory, if you will. It's at least here in other places. And many folks think consciousness also, in at least part, uh, lives in the cerebellum. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting area of the brain is very uh, important on planning and programming voluntary movements, learned movements and skilled movements. You have the area of the cerebellum called the vermis, and the vermis helps you regulate posture. And the flocconodular lobe 
helps you regulate eye movement for balancing and for equilibrium that you need to do during uh, movement tracking. So the cerebellum helps keep you upright. It keeps your learning movements adequate. The learning, the learning part happens in the lateral atmospheres on the sides. Um, and uh, um, all of the cerebellum needs to be, you know, well done to have people move appropriately. Um, it's kind of an ancient part of movement. Evolutionarily, it was there long before the cortex was there. So you wonder if it wasn't like the, the major locus of motor control um, early in the course of our evolution. But it's still there and it's not a remnant, it's, it's very active. And just like any other part of your brain, um, like the cortex, it needs blood flow. And so you can have cerebellar disorders that uh, occur. Um, and when you, when you do have a disordered cerebellum, like you could stroke out on your cerebellum, you won't have smooth coordinated uh, activity of, of your muscle excitation. And you'll have postural uh, disorders and you'll have balance disorders. So this could be anything from a, a, a hemorrhage, a trauma to the back of the head, tumors, abscesses, viral infections, alcohol can do it, stroke can do it. And then you can have ataxia, hypotonia, tremors, disturbances. As I said, you need to figure that out. What's interesting is in movement, the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body, left side controls right side. So it's contralateral just like pain sensing, but in cerebellum, it's ipsilateral. So left side cerebellum controls left side stuff, right side, right side stuff. So if I have an infarct to my left sided cerebellum, I show the manifestations on my left side. If I have an infarct on my right side of my Broadman area, uh, a four for whatever reason, it's it's on the contralateral side. So and you can have both. You can have cerebellar and cortical changes that can can you know make movement a, a great a great challenge. So I want to set this pattern up, and I'm not done talking about the basal ganglia. You'll you'll see that's going to come in here as part of the corticospinal tract. I want to say here. And this is the right slide to use. I want to say here that I want to follow the, the red arrows. That here's a brain. So now we're, we've cut the brain. This is in a transverse. Um, uh, uh, no, this is in a... Um, uh, this is in sagittal. Transverse is this way. This is in a frontal. This is in a frontal orientation. So looking deep into the slide would be anterior. Now we're looking posterior. And what you're seeing here is they've sectioned it. This would be the this would be the motor cortex right here on both sides. So we're seeing that here's an upper motor neuron. And here's the so you know from whatever from whatever it's activating, it's coming on down, coming on down, coming on down. And it comes to this area of the midbrain, and it courses through this uh, area of the midbrain. And from the midbrain, it goes to the medulla in the brainstem. And now, in the medulla of the brainstem, this is very important. This is the place where the neuron. This is all one neuron. One, this is a first-order neuron. It crosses over. So in this brain, this is the right side, and in the medulla, it crossed over. That's called decussation. And then it traveled down the spinal cord from the medulla, down the spinal cord in a tract that's called the corticospinal tract. That's still all the same neuron. So it went from brain decussated and went down a special tract of the spinal cord and the blue is illustrating it. It's in the white matter, 
It's a descending elevator from the penthouse down to the ground level floor that's very fast. It's called the corticospinal tract. Now, what happens is that comes in. Some of these talk to interneurons and some of them don't. And then there is a synapse with the alpha motor neuron that goes out to the muscle. And that would be the second order neuron. Now, there are some cortical neurons that don't decussate. Almost like 95%, almost all of them do. 95% you know, percent of them do. Some of them do travel down the ipsilateral side. But that's not the main way by which this information is transmitted. So, motor cortex down medulla, cross over, down the descending corticospinal tract, inner neuron or not, because there's some with and some without, and synapse with the alpha motor neuron, which activates the muscle. These are planned movements. These are movements that regulate fine motor behavior, like playing the piano with your fingers. Did the cerebellum talk to this pathway? Yes, it did. The cerebellum has that crosstalk to make the patterns that have been learned, incorporated into your output, coming down through this pathway. And so the corticospinal tract controls the voluntary muscles of the head, the neck, and the limbs. Tennis swing, golf swing, foul free throw shooting, hitting a baseball, whatever. And that's its significance. So that's our primary motor pathway. And it's planned. And it's fine-tuned. I want to come back to this slide. I think I want to come back to this slide to talk about this part. But I'm not going to do it now. I just right now want to say that the corticospinal tract through the spinal cord is this one that I just described. And I, I also want to mention that when it crosses over in the medulla, this, this, this nerve, when it literally goes in this other direction, it crosses over in this pyramid, pyramid, this medullary pyramid, it's a region. So the corticospinal tract is often referred to as the pyramidal tract. They're the same thing. They're equal. Here, here we have it right here. The, the basal ganglia and this, that's what this is. This is showing you basal ganglia going down through some other tracks. That isn't through the pyramidal tract. That's called an extra pyramidal tract. And I'm going to come back to that. But right now, let's just stay here, as I said, with the, with the pyramidal corticospinal tract. Here's a nice picture. It's showing you the area of derivation. Hey, I want to move my finger. I bring my impulse down through the pawns, through the medulla. I decussate through the pyramids. I go to the other side. It goes down the corticospinal tract in the white matter. And I should say tracks. There are several tracks. There are many ele there are several elevators that take this impulse down. That's all one nerve. Then it may or may not hit an interneuron, but ultimately it will innervate the alpha motor neuron, which goes to the muscle. So it controls precise movements, hand control, facial control. It maintains muscle tone, sensitivity to load. It facilitates muscle spindles. It's very pronounced in humans and in apes. 
And lesions of this, this one neuron, sort of two neurons, lesions here are pretty rare. But if you do have a lesion, like if you had a stroke along the way, you would have an inability to do those fine movements, grasping fine motor control. So this, and know the areas here, handles face, neck, limbs. The extrapyramidal pathway is that other one. It's this one. This is coming down from the basal ganglia through the red nucleus. So the basal ganglia is like in here, through the red nucleus, comes on down through other tracts, and it modulates movements, and it has different functions in that it regulates your 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 um, your trunk. It maintains posture. So let's look at the basal ganglia, which is the which is the main part of the extrapyramidal tract. So instead of the cortex, this arrange this is arranged in purple here. You see it. It's deeper in the brain, and you've got different areas of it: the subthalamic nucleus, the globus pallidus, the substantia nigra the putamen, and the caudate nuclease. And if you go back to our little graphic before, here you see it in that frontal plane. So what the basal ganglia are, are large masses of gray matter. They're deep to the cerebral hemispheres. And they help movement. They initiate, coordinate, and execute movement. And they control skeletal muscles, but they're doing so in the trunk, particularly in the back muscles. So when these are off, you can't maintain upright posture as well. And it might result in someone leaning forward, i.e. Parkinson disease. So the basal ganglia has, as I said, its own pathways. And within its own pathways through extrapyramidal tracts, so here's the way I would think about it. Here's your brain. Here's the motor neuron. And your corticospinal neuron comes down and talks to the motor neuron. And your extrapyramidal neurons, they come on down through separate tracks. And they can modulate this motor neuron. And they can also spin off and control your postural muscles. So they can modulate fine control, but they have their biggest influence on postural muscles, whereas the corticospinal neurons are on the limbs and on the face. Now, the basal ganglia has two, um, what should we call it, elements, two sort of sub-pathways. One is called the direct pathway, and one is called the indirect pathway. And so the direct pathway helps you move when movement is desired. Now, there's a great video here, a YouTube, that you'll watch. It's three minutes, and it tells you it uses a, a, a very similar graphic to what I have up on the screen. And it's going to tell you the following. Um, it's going to tell you that the motor cortex has made a decision to move. So now the cortex has, came down, has come down here and is now talking to the basal ganglia. And what the basal ganglia is doing is it's modulating your movement. So... It sends glutamate through the pathways that we just discussed, you know, through the NMDA receptor, et cetera. And it's going to activate, that's what the plus sign <clears throat> illustrates, this area of the basal ganglia called the striatum. The striatum is the caudate and the putamen, these two regions together. So, the motor cortex is activating that region of the basal ganglia. And what happens is um, the striatum sends impulses 
to the globus pallidus internal and the substantia nigra pars reticulata. These are also parts of the basal ganglia. And these are inhibitory influences through GABA, so they're letting chloride in. So this was a this stimulated this, and when this got stimulated, this inhibited these areas. Okay, so to keep the double negatives going, what happens is the globus pallidus internal and the substantia nigra pars reticulata typically inhibit the thalamus. And they do so by making GABA and causing chloride to come in and not letting it hit threshold. But by having more inhibition from the striatum, there's less GABA, and this activates the thalamus more, and the thalamus, after discussion and editing, says, you know what, motor cortex, thanks for checking with us down here in the basal ganglia. Thalamus is the relay station. It says, you know what, everything's good from this end. Go on here and send a signal down through the corticospinal tract and make a movement. So it makes glutamate, and now you have that action potential coming down the first order neuron. So you move when movement is desired. And you didn't just go do that. You checked first with the basal ganglia. And then don't, it's not on here, but you also checked over here with the cerebellum. And both of those things talk to the thalamus, which told you then how to make your action potentials to make that muscle move. And that's what this video is going to tell you. There's an area, and I'll cover this at the end, called the substantia nigra pars compacta that also talks to the striatum. That's very rich in dopamine. And it actually stimulates the striatum like the motor cortex does. And this area is the area that gets messed up with Parkinson's. And so in Parkinson's, the, the, the loss of dopamine in the substantia nigra pars compacta doesn't signal through dopamine 1 receptors to the striatum. And everything we said about moving and sending impulses is going to be dampened. So in Parkinson's, the execution of movement isn't as good as without Parkinson's because these neurons are dying off and losing their crosstalk to the striatum. And this video will help you understand the direct basal ganglia as I just explained it. But also the basal ganglia has an indirect pathway. And the indirect pathway is to stop unwanted movements. Like tremors and whatnot. And here's a video that same author uh, of the videos, the YouTubes, showing you it's similar. Um, 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 it, again, in the big scheme, it's stopping unwanted movements or, or checking even wanted movements to, to helping regulate the, the, the amount of movement. And it works like this. The motor cortex says, hey, you know, I want to send an impulse over here to my muscles. And I want to talk about it first with my basal ganglia. So it sends an impulse to the striatum through glutamate. And now the striatum talks almost in a conference with the globus pallidus external. That wasn't on the other one. And what it does is it sends inhibitory influences to it. And so what happens is the globus pallidus external then would have, um, it normally sends GABAergic signaling to the subthalamic nucleus. And you will have decreased GABA, which means then there's more activity of the subthalamic nucleus.
and when it gets activated that causes more glutamate which activates the globus pallidus internal so that excites this and when this gets excited that makes inhibition of the thalamus through GABA when the thalamus is inhibited it says hey you know what motor cortex we're not feeling good about this it slows down the movement it makes decreased movement and in Parkinson's the substantia nigra pars compacta is destroyed there's less dopamine and it also has less activity on the striatum and what that does is it gives too long of a dog leash to the thalamus and it's letting unwanted movements start to creep in in Parkinson's now that's a whole bunch of googly gargle uh, this turns on this turns off this turns on this turns off this turns on this turns off and it's all getting balanced out with acetylcholine I don't expect you to get down into the nuances I just want you to get a picture of basal ganglia indirect and direct pathway what the general gist of them are and I just simply at this point in time you know for testing and even for understanding want you to know that the the substantia nigra pars compacta is the area where where dopamine signaling is off in Parkinson's so both the direct and indirect pathways are off meaning you don't move when you want to move and you have unwanted movements when you didn't want to move through these two pathways so when you walk through the videos this will make a little bit more sense I apologize for the you know there's a thousand arrows here doing double negatives inhibition excitation etc but you'll, you'll you'll come out of this thinking about what I care about is the bigger picture on when you have an impairment in the basal ganglia you can't move as well as you want to move and you move when you don't want to move and one of the things about Parkinson's if you have a tremor and then you say okay now I'm going to do something with my hand the tremor goes away with voluntary movement so there's there's control dominance through the direct pathway and the corticospinal pathways that are um, involved here but nonetheless this is at the level of the basal ganglia now what are their elevators well if you look here at the spinal cord you see the extra pyramidal tracts and they're named vestibular spinal tract the reticular spinal tract the rubral spinal tract the tecto spinal tract these are all the extra pyramidal tracts you can find them in the different colors along the way here and so they are carrying information from the basal ganglia and these modify your impulses that come from the cortex and as I said when you have damage to this area you get ticks dystonia spasm tremors the Parkinson's phenomenon so let's take this spinal cord and let's blow it up into a nice big picture so we can see things and what you have are these medial extrapyramidal pathways illustrated here so here's one the um, the pontine reticulous spinal tract right here here's one the lateral vestibular spinal tract right here they're almost in the same area they're in this white matter kind of in the front of the cord this is the ventral this is the dorsal root and look at where their projections enter they come in from the front and what's sitting in there are the alpha motor neurons that are going out to the muscle over here so that's how they're going to modify they had the basal ganglia up here send the impulses down these tracks and then they come in here and they modify what's going on in those areas so what does the pontine reticulous spinal and lateral vestibular spinal tract do it controls the axial muscles axial muscles are um, um, muscles of like the neck and the shoulders and they do so by causing um, control a little bit more of extensors over the flexors extensors over the flexors keep your head back keep your head back neck flexions this extensions this so you can see like with the downward neck projection how that can 
offset your center of gravity and can lead to falls and whatnot. That would be mediated through these two pathways. Then you've got lateral pathways of the rubrospinal tract and the medullary reticulospinal tract over here. They're in like different positions, also in the white matter. And the rubrospinal has some control of arm movements, not the, not the fine control, but, but they help regulate it. And it has some excitement over the flexors of the arm compared to the extensors, like biceps over triceps. And then the lateral or the medullary reticulous spinal tract has an, inhibit, has an inhibitory influence on stretch reflexes. So the basal ganglia is maintaining body posture by maintaining uh, 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 kind of neck positioning and shoulder positioning, trunk positioning, and modulating limbs and inhibiting stretch reflexes. So it's very important in the overall cascade of things. So let me just go here a second. You know, I don't know if we like this one or maybe I like this one better. Let's get rid of the, let's get rid of the, the markings on here and go to the eraser. I just gave you like a pretty intense wiring diagram. And you need to be able to visualize it that you want to have your cortex talk to your muscles. And the corticospinal tract is the way that that's done. But the cortex doesn't make decisions without talking to other areas in the brain, i.e. the basal ganglia, i.e. the cerebellum. So there's this constant crosstalk, it's a big circle, where it's checking with the direct and indirect pathways of the basal ganglia, which communicates through the thalamus back to it, the cerebellum back to it, and the brainstem, like the medulla, back and forth and back to it, which then informs the cerebral, the cerebral cortex about the execution, the initiation and the execution, the magnitude, the intensity coming down to the spinal cord. So this is like a conference going on helping make your motor control regulated, your fine motor control regulated. And then in and of itself, the direct and indirect basal ganglia has this action not only on regulating your fine movement, but in regulating your trunk stability and balance and axial um, um, in, in, uh, integrity at the level of the, of the um, neck and, and whatnot, as is um, illustrated on some of these slides. So it's important to kind of in, envision that. And um, now could be a good time for, for any uh, uh, questions or comments that you might have before I go before I go forward, before I go forward. That's a lot. And it, 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 it's a, you know, if you're not kind of like well into neuroanatomy, which none of us are, I mean, it's its own thing. Um, that really stretches back to reviews. Those of you that are undergraduates that had anatomy physiology a couple of years ago, you're, you're best apt to think through those pathways. But those of you that have been out of school or even graduate student, myself included, I'm a physiologist, I'm not a neuroanatomist. Knowing the pathways requires some like, you know, homework, I suppose. But just envision the wiring diagram as a whole, and this becomes more natural in understanding movement. So if, if there are no questions, let me just kind of go forward and pick up here at the alpha motor neuron. So what I, what, I, what I laid out is this stuff that's going on in the brain and the, and the pathways coming down, ultimately talking to the alpha motor neuron. And 
the corticospinal tracts come down into this ventral horn. So look up here in this blue area. And the different muscle groups have their alpha motor neuron cell bodies located in different spots. So like your, your girdle muscles are located kind of medially in the ventral horn. Your axial muscles a little, I'm sorry, laterally in the ventral horn. Your axial muscles a little bit more medial. Your extensors versus your flexors. Your flexors are a little bit more lateral than your extensors. Uh, the intermediate zone is an area of uh, sympathetic uh, neurons that are ready to go out to ganglia. You see that in the thoracic vertebrae. And back here is where all your sensory activity and your dorsal horn is going on. All of that's in the gray matter. And so your, your alpha motor neurons emerge from these areas, depending upon where they're going, in a dermatomal segmented area. And they come out through the spinal nerves first as roots. And then they break off into the trunks in orange. And then they go into divisions, like the anterior or posterior division of the muscles that come from the um, um, cervical and the brachial plexus. And then they break off into individual nerve tracts that feed various muscles. So these alpha motor neurons are actually being carried in the spinal nerves and they get this sort of um, logistical pathway dispersion to make it down to the given muscle fibers in which they innervate. Now when you have one alpha motor neuron and you look at all the single or individual muscle fibers that it innervates, that's called a motor unit. A motor unit is, here's one motor neuron and every single muscle fiber, not muscle, but muscle fibers. A muscle is comprised of muscle fibers. And so here you see different neurons talking to different muscle fibers in the red and the pink. So a motor unit is in a fine-tuned muscle something that has an alpha motor neuron and just a couple muscle fibers by which it controls. Where you don't have fine motor control, like in your gluteus maximus or your latissimus dorsi, you have these motor units where you have an alpha motor neuron and hundreds of muscle fibers. So there's lesser muscle fibers in fine motor control, like around your eye, your nose, your mouth, your fingers. And that gets a little disrupted when you don't need fine motor control. So this really shows you nicely, picture then, you came down through the corticospinal tract, and then you innervated onto the alpha motor neuron, that's the second neuron, one, two. And again, some of these do have inner neurons, some of them do have inner neurons. So you could call it one, two, the inner neuron, and then make this three, but nonetheless, this impulse from the cortex makes its way down onto the spinal nerve. Now, here's a great picture of nerve anatomy. And the dendrites, the cell body, the axon, the myelin. And this is showing you the synaptic bulb like we talked about with the synapses. Only now it's showing you on the bottom a little piece of a muscle fiber. And when it comes to the muscle, the synapse isn't between one nerve and another nerve. Here, it's a nerve and a muscle fiber. So we're going to talk about the synapse at the level of the nerve coming, the alpha motor neuron, and the muscle itself, or the muscle fiber itself. And this is called the motor end plate. So let's take this area and increase its magnification. Well, I'm going to come back to this slide, come back to that slide. I'm going to come back to those two in a moment and have it look like this. So here's the nerve, the alpha motor neuron, and here's the muscle. So when this alpha motor neuron gets its impulse from the cortical spinal neuron, it fires an action potential. It comes on down. It lets calcium come in the synaptic bulb. 
and you get the vesicle to release acetylcholine because that's the main neurotransmitter at the at the neuromuscular junction and the acetylcholine drips off and binds to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle and causes the muscle to make an action potential and so that's the neuromuscular junction and when acetylcholine binds to its acetylcholine receptors the muscle makes an action potential because when it depolarizes sodium goes into it so that's a sodium in potassium out and when it gets excited like that that's where the myofilaments get excited and you can and swivel the muscle so that's the point on this neuromuscular junction it's releasing acetylcholine to activate the muscle depolarize it so that it could contract you've got areas of ventral horns that are sort of anatomically unique where they're really really large so remember that alpha motor neurons come from the ventral horn and look how big they are in the cervical area and in the lumbar area compared to the thoracic area the blue illustrates how like hypertrophied that gray matter is that's because of all those muscles that are innervated cervical area to the uh, to the arm and the lumbar area to the leg there's a lot of motor alpha motor neuron cell bodies in those areas so they're enlarged related to that circuitry and the sacral area the thoracic area doesn't have it as much because they don't have all those muscles to control and you know that if you're looking at the at the skeletal muscle innervation there are well delineated anterior and posterior markings on where the innervation pattern is of the various musculature at one time i absolutely positively had this memorized um that was 30 years ago um now i would have to look at this chart to see what innervates what where the nerve roots are for the various muscle groups but if someone say had poor leg um, extension of the uh, uh, this would be the left leg well one of the things you might consider would be like a lesion at lumbar level number two if it was a lower motor neuron dysfunction or it could have been a right-sided lesion affecting the downplay to lumbar two so we break off these neural pathways and movement dysfunction is the upper side coming from the brain on down through the cord and then the alpha motor neuron going out to the muscle based upon the segmental muscle innervation so that that alpha motor neuron releases the acetylcholine it binds acetylcholine receptors and then causes sodium entry and depolarization in the muscle cell now I got to tell you that when the muscle depolarizes then sodium comes in that lets calcium get released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that calcium goes into the muscle cell it binds troponin gets rid of the tropomyosin inhibition and actin and myosin can swivel on one another and now this muscle cell can squeeze together and can contract that's all predicated on acetylcholine so you need to be able to release acetylcholine and there are some problems that we have in releasing acetylcholine I mentioned a couple weeks ago or it might have been last week Lambert Eaton syndrome that's where you have antibody destruction that you don't get calcium at the synaptic bulb to release the acetylcholine quanta it's autoimmune you don't, you're not able to conduct the acetylcholine on out so then you wouldn't be able to release adequate acetylcholine your aminoglycoside antibiotics interfere with the acetylcholine release botulism interferes with the acetylcholine release when people get bot you know you got a wrinkle because my eyes squeeze like this and then I give botulin botulism toxin in the eye 
what you're actually doing is you're paralyzing those muscles. So now my wrinkles expand because I'm not squeezing down on them so much. Well, botulism can be toxic because it, you know, in, in your skeletal muscles because of that. So all of these could not allow adequate acetylcholine to be released to make the muscle ultimately contract. And then you've got a terrible disease, myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disease where you release acetylcholine, but the receptors are destroyed. And they're ionotropic receptors. They don't let sodium in. So then the muscle can't contract. So then your diaphragm might not work and you may not be able to breathe. First manifestations are an ocular dysfunction. So these are all issues that can go on at the alpha motor neuron or in the muscle, uh, many of which are autoimmune. This shows you the same sort of image. Here's the alpha motor neuron, acetylcholine and acetylcholine receptors letting sodium in and showing you the target of myasthenia gravis, botulism, antibiotics, and Lambert-Eaton with a little, with a little um, um, description beneath it as the previous slide. So in this video that um, I made, when you watch it, I do a thing where I walk you through how skeletal muscles contract. Like a, before, I just, in, right now, I just told you really fast, calcium comes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and binds troponin, gets rid of tropomyosin and actin and myosin. Yeah, that's all in this video. So I'll go through that in this video really slowly, how the muscle contracts. And then you get sarcomere shortening and the muscle pulls against the tendon, the tendon against the bone, and you move. And this is really important, not only to understand how skeletal muscle works, but it will also be um, a, a helper in thinking how the heart pumps, because many of the features of heart pumping are shared in the, in the skeletal muscle um, uh, um, discussion. So this is a really important video. Please watch it, study it, and understand how muscles contract. And then muscles are classic structure function. You can make them big. You know, if you do exercise and if you're doing bed rest or something, immobilization, they could, they could shrink, they could atrophy. In that video, I would watch the video and at the same time, I might even open up this slide. So this is the steps showing that, okay, here comes alpha motor neuron. Here comes acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptor, action potential through the skeletal muscle, that's in brown, down the transverse tubule, prompting the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium binds to troponin. Troponin gets rid of tropomyosin. Myosin binds and swivels as long as there's ATP. And it will continue to swivel and swivel and swivel causing the sarcomeres to shorten until the calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then when calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, tropomyosin, which is like the pink line here, blocks the interaction so it can't contract. So the calcium will continue to be released as long as action potentials are being made in the skeletal muscle cell from the alpha motor neuron prompting them to do so. And as soon as you put the calcium away, that's because this was terminated because the acetylcholine got degraded by the acetylcholine esterase. Then the muscle will relax. So we have this constant basis of contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. In anyone's given muscles, you've got type 1 muscle fibers and type 2 muscle fibers, and even gray area types of muscle fibers. The type 1 muscle fibers are fatigue resistant that are really good for long-term aerobic exercise. They're not real powerful, but they're really resistant to fatigue. They got a lot of myoglobin in them, so they're able to consume a lot of oxygen, and they're really good at aerobic metabolism. Type 2 muscle fibers are really good for anaerobic, explosive kinds of exercise. Lots of power. They get tired fast, though. They hold on to lots of glycogen. They do anaerobic glycolysis really, really well. 
they stain in a, a, a whiter type of a color. These stain more in a redder type of a color because they're with less myoglobin. So they're pale compared to the red. And you can think about like, instead of these as examples, think about a chicken. If you eat the white meat from chicken, like a chicken breast, it's white in its, in its, its, its pallor. Well, that's glycolytic muscle. Chickens are very powerful when they go to fly away, but they're not always flying. They're usually just standing. And if you look at chicken legs, they're reddish muscle, they're slow twitch muscle for postural stability. They don't get fatigued. So different muscle groups have different distribution of these types of muscle fibers. And as I said, there's intermediates along the way. And these fast anaerobic types of um, muscle fibers have gigantic alpha motor neuron neurosynapses. They cover this big wide space. And a lot of acetylcholine is released very promptly. It's not just the muscle, the alpha motor neurons able to excite it much, much more um, uh, forcefully. So we come to this idea of uh, skeletal muscle, kind of the clinical assessment, and reflexes are a big part of this. So someone comes to you and they're having motor disturbances. And, you know, what you're generally going to do is you're going to look at, you know, muscle tone. You could do some strength analysis, gait and posture. You could look at reflexes and you look at symmetry. Like, are they leaning one way or the other? How are they balancing their, their, their body? And physical medicine does this all the time. And there are actually objective measures of, of all of these. Reflex is something that you would often do. And so when you do your reflex, like the classic one is the tibial, uh, you know, hammer on the quadriceps tendon. Um, what you hear, what you do here is you tap with your little hammer, the, um, the tendon. And when you tap that tendon, you make a stretch on the muscle fiber. And the muscle fiber that gets stretched is the quadriceps muscle group. So you have these sensory neurons embedded in the muscle fiber that are called muscle spindles. They're type 1A fibers. They help provide some motor tone. And um, um, you can think about those in the assessment. But what, what the, the long end of this story is, is when you stretch the muscle, like if this gets too long, which it thinks that's what's happening when you tap on the tendon. You've got incoming information that goes through the dorsal horn. Their stretch, hey, be careful. We don't want to tear the muscle. So without even talking to your brain, the reflex is right at the level of the cord. It talks to the alpha motor neuron coming out at that segment and then induces a contraction. The, the, the outgoing is an alpha motor neuron to cause the quadricep muscles to contract in response to the stretch. Now, if you have too much muscle spindle activity, like if it's too tightly regulated, that can lead to spasticity and is associated with clonus, like where you bounce back and forth after a movement. Um, and decreased activity could lead to the hypotony, the floppiness of muscle. So the muscle spindles are giving you kind of like the, the character of the muscle, and then whether or not you have the reflex can be very telling. And, and, and you're thinking about if there's some sort of a lesion across the alpha motor neuron or not. So they're providing feedback naturally. So not only do the, uh, the corticospinal tracts and the extrapyramidal tracts modulate the alpha motor neuron, so too does reflex activity. And so too of the reflex activity, some of them are muscle spindles and some of them are Golgi tendon organs in the, in the muscle tendon to, to prevent from ripping a tendon off of the bone. They all come in and help regulate the muscle fiber. Now, I would like to just say, when you agonize the alpha motor neurons of the quadriceps that contract, there's also a relaxation of the hamstring muscles. So the knee jerk, you know, you, you, you jerk your knee up when you tap the tendon, and that's the reflex. That just happens automatically. 
So you can use this in thinking about if someone's got motor dysfunction, you want to characterize it in the lower motor neuron, that's the alpha motor neuron, or is it in the upper motor neuron, the one coming down from the brain, down the cord? So the alpha motor neurons in the ventral gray matter of the cord and their axons, that's the final pathway, that's the lower motor neuron. And they will respond to excitatory or inhibitory inputs in the cord, so here's your cord, from say the corticospinal, the extra pyramidal from the basal ganglia and reflex activity. And let's make this the ventral, the ventral area, ventral area right here. I'm trying to draw some gray matter in here. Here's the ventral area, ventral area. They're coming in here and they're talking to this ventral area, determining what the alpha motor neuron is going to do. There's crosstalk of these descending influences and reflex influences on this ventral horn controlling this motor neuron. So if someone has a problem with the alpha motor neuron and not these other upstream influences, you can have problems. You can have weakness. Okay, that doesn't tell you much, but it will be regulated at a dermatomal or a cord segment level. So that's one thing to look at. You might see muscle atrophy. You might see an absent deep tendon reflex. Tap, nothing happened. Now, in physical medicine and whatnot, they'll do EMG, you know, electromyography. Sometimes it's called mylog, myloography. But electromyography, to look at the electrical potentials, you know, to look at the, the nerve-carrying uh, uh, action potentials on an EMG. And that could tell you if it's denervated or not. And then you can also do things like passive movement. Someone could just, you know, take your quadricep in that example and say, okay, try to resist. And then they're moving, they're moving their movement and there's no resistance. That could show you that there's a lesion in the lower motor neuron. So again, I'm no expert on assessing skeletal muscle. This, this, is, this falls into the, the physical medicine first and maybe the rheumatoid the rheumatological realm, but there are some classic examples of diseases that preferentially whack off your, 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 your lower motor neurons, like polio, terrible. Uh, in pediatric populations, in spinal muscular atrophy. So they preferentially hurt that alpha motor neuron. Then there are conditions that can demyelinate the, the um, axons, like Jan Bure, get rid of the myelin. Um, uh, peripheral neuropathy, because of inositol um, uh, signaling in nerves that might occur with diabetes. Or maybe a disc is leaning on a root of a nerve, and that would have sensory um, uh, manifestations as well as motor impairments. Um, other ways of compression or entrapment. Maybe the vertebrae is, is sifted over. Maybe there's a fracture. Maybe there's a tumor. Anything that leans on this nerve could impair the loader motor neuron. Or you could have a nerve trauma. You hurt it in some way, shape, or form with blunt force trauma or, you know, with something sharp. So any of this could hurt the... Um, lower, lower motor neuron and lead to these kinds of outputs. And so that would be uh, different and distinct in your examination and trying to place it with this as a clinical body. And compare and contrast it to an upper motor, motor neuron lesion, which is the brain on down through the cord before it synapses with the alpha motor neuron. So most commonly refers to effects seen after relatively large lesions of the sensory motor cortex. So those Broadman areas. It could occur at the internal capsule as it works its way down through the midbrain into the thalamus. Um, it could be a deficit in the corticospinal tract, although they're generally rare. 
or could be loss of the elevators going down and the reticulospinal extrapyramidal neurons. Um, um, you can see loss of inhibition of stretch reflexes that normally allows for coordinated control of opposing muscle groups. So your stretch reflexes aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And um, you can see changes in appropriate tone um, of, of muscles. Um, what do I want to say about this? Balance and posture are generally preserved. And gross movements on your trunk and whatnot are generally preserved. But what you'll see if someone has a motor, an upper motor neuron lesion, weakness, a lack of coordination, fine movement, distal movements, fingers, most impaired, stiffness, clasp knife, spasticity, Babinski reflex, toe, increased deep tendon reflexes. So lower motor neuron absence, increased, so upreg up, upregulated. Um, and so this can often make you think about unilateral lesions because the deficits are often unilateral. And um, spasticity and hyperreflex, yeah, along with flexor rigidity, are some of the hallmark signs. So what are our diseases? Well, a stroke would be an upper motor neuron lesion. A spinal cord lesion, you know, uh, depending upon the level, would be an example of that. Cerebral palsy, a tumor in the brain or along the spinal cord, and even multiple sclerosis, which we talked a little bit about, would have some lower motor neuron lesions because of the myelin, for sure, but is also affecting uh, upper motor neurons. It really impacts cranial nerves, for example and your special senses are greatly disturbed. So think of the hyper-reflexive reflexive response versus the lower reflexive response, the spastic, spasticity, class knife response, even, even like that cogwheel spasticity, you know, like we go like that and then it, it's like in little sections of spasticity against the uh, against even passive movement, that's all associated with upper motor neuron lesions. Um, um, and